For those of you who are new, my name is Jeremy. Uh, I want to welcome those watching in Olean and Arcade, as well as our online viewers as well. Uh, I'm grateful that uh, over the last several weeks, as one teenager um, who will rename nameless asked me uh, at the youth gathering on Friday, where have you been? She's like, where have you been? I thought you left or something. I'm like, no, 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 we're still here. We're still here. We took a vacation last week for Aaron's family uh, reunion, and then we were able to get over to the other campuses while the campus pastors were preaching. So I'm, I'm grateful that they were giving the word. They did a great job. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, you don't have to clap too loud for that, but like you're not clapping at all. Come on, show a little appreciation. They did good. Pastor John gave the word last week, and uh, Eber and Pastor Andy and Stu are grateful that we have a team of preachers uh, that we can entrust with God's word. And so I want to start a brand new series today, as you see on the screen, called Search Party. Who's ready for a party? I'm ready for a party? I think Sunday morning should be a little bit of a party, a celebration. I think it's almost bad if, if church is boring, because God's not boring, and we should be able to celebrate new life in Christ. And so I want to talk to you about how, essentially this, if lost people matter to God, which wouldn't you agree, lost, lost things matter to God, broken things matter to God, lost people matter to God. If that's true, then they should matter to us as well. The question, though, is do they? I mean, do they? Do they really? Because here's what I know. If you value something, if, if you really, really value something, when it's lost, what will you do? What will you do? You'll search for it, right? You'll, you'll not just casually search for it, but you'll actively, with, with passion and energy, you'll go about searching for that thing if it has great value to you. And I'm going to say this later too, but the degree in which you search for something that's lost also determines the degree in which you value it, right? If you truly search after it, if you truly go after it, it shows that you value something of great value. Let me give you an example. Case in point, I was starting to think of a story to share with you, and I thought, oh yeah, I got a three-year-old um, who loves to wander, by the way. He, he seemingly loves to get lost, Josiah does. That's my three-year-old. Don't you think he's precious? Isn't he precious? If you don't think so, you can leave the church, okay? Uh, but he is precious, and uh, we love him. Obviously, we value him, um, but there's so many examples that I could give you today. I'll just give you a few, and I, I'm going to say this as a disclaimer do not judge me, okay? Do not judge me. You're, you might be worse as a parent. I don't know. But I, so we lose Josiah from time to time, okay? And Josiah likes to wander. Maybe I'll put it that way. I remember about a year ago, we were in Kmart uh, getting a Little Caesars, not so hot and ready. I know Olean campus, you guys have a Little Caesars there in Olean. You go to the Olean Little Caesars, it's hot and ready. Like you can walk in, grab your pizza, pay for it, and, and go about your day. Not so much in Wellsville, okay, but we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. You go in there, and it's not hot and ready. you got to wait. And so while you're waiting and then you have time to burn, what do you do if you have four boys? Where do you go? You go to the toy section. You go to the Lego aisle. So we go to the Lego aisle, just kind of kill some time. You know, we put on the superhero mask, and that's a lot of fun. And we're having a blast, waiting for our pizza. And two year, I think he was two years old at the time. And we're looking around, and we're like, who's got Josiah? I thought you had Josiah. Like, Aiden, I thought you had Josiah. Aaron, I thought and Josiah is no, nowhere to be found. We can't find Josiah. So, of course, we head to the exit of Kmart because you want to make sure that someone didn't steal him and is running away from him. So we take that, and we're going down, you know, the sporting section. We're looking all over Kmart. We get on the loudspeaker, you know, attention Kmart shoppers, you know, red light special, find the redhead, and, you know, try to get him. And so we're searching everywhere. We've got strangers, complete strangers, joining in on the search for Josiah. And we just, we kept going because, I mean, he's my kid, right? You got you to find him. Well, about five minutes later after worrying, I think, this is how I remember, he like appears out of like, you know, the ladies' clothing section and, you know, underneath the rack or something. And, and a huge relief of like, oh, whew, Josiah's not lost. We got him. That's only one story. And uh, I'm going to share three stories from the Bible today, so I might as well just share three stories of Josiah. Uh, about a month, uh, about two months ago in July, Ethan was at a Gus Macker basketball tournament. It's a three-on-three tournament that they do in Hornell where the whole main street is blocked off, and they put the actual basketball hoops in the street. And it's all blocked off hundreds, if not thousands of people at this, at this spot. And so we were waiting for Ethan's next game to start. Had a lot of time to kill, and so... I remember going to the Dollar General. We got Gatorades for the boys, and, you know, we were just hanging around. And, and all of a sudden, like, Josiah's gone. 
Like, we can't find Josiah. I, I panic. I, at least Kmart's got like a container, like a building. There's like hundreds of people that he could be anywhere. So we scramble down that road. We scramble down this road. My mom's looking. My, my wife's looking. I'm looking. We can't. And then a light bulb goes off in my head. Like Josiah, when we were in that, the Dollar General, he wanted a sucker. Like he was begging for a sucker. So I thought, I, I'm going to go look there. And so I go into the Dollar General, and wouldn't you know, lo and behold, Josiah's like shoplifting a, a, a lollipop or something, like caught red-handed, the redhead red-handed. And, and, and so we, you know, we, we found him. It was a huge relief, and there was a lot of joy and celebration as a result. Um, last story, because i got to share this. Um, we're really close with our neighbors, like uh, figuratively, literally, geographically, also relationally, we're close with our neighbors. They're a great Christian family. They attend our church. I'm not sure if they're here now, so I can maybe edit the story later, although their family is, so just, just, this is funny, okay? So, so, so Josiah, a three-year-old, and Maddox, a three-year-old, they're best friends. They go everywhere together, do everything together. They're always over each other's homes. And I'm talking any time of the day, 6.30 in the morning, they're in each other's homes. Like, I've been in my boxers before and had to send Maddox out of the house. Like, you got to go. Like, you can't be in here right now. And so, um, I know. And so, and Josiah is constantly trying to get out of the house. And so, we've, we've developed this principle and this habit of barricading our doors, not just locking. We, we had to lock them because, not, not that we're worried that Maddox is going to come in, but we're worried that Josiah is going to get out. So we literally barricade our doors. We barricade ourselves in our own home to, to keep our three-year-old from leaving and, and wandering away because he loves to wander. Well, this one particular Saturday morning, our neighbors were not home. They had left early in the morning. And we were about to head out to the YMCA, I remember. I think it was a Saturday, and we were getting the boys together. And if you have a lot of kids, you know how hard it is to get a bunch of kids ready. And so we're scrambling around, wear their clothes, and we finally get Josiah's clothes ready and no Josiah. Like, we don't know where he is. He's not in the attic. He's not downstairs, not in our backyard. He's been known to wander down the street. So we check all the way down the street. Can't find Josiah. And a light bulb goes off in my head. I bet you he's in the neighbor's house. But the neighbors are not home. And so we... She had to go <laughs> into the neighbor's house, and there was, lo and behold, Josiah playing with Maddox toys. They're not even home. I hope they know this, um, but I think we're really close. It was just, this kid is prone to wander, prone to leave the parents that he's supposed to love, you know, and he just has that spirit. Now, be, before you go judging Jojo, that's you. And, and that was me before we became followers of Christ. We were lost. We were hopeless without Christ. And the reality is, even if you call yourself a follower of Christ, you still wander. You still have that heart to wander away from the Father and get yourself lost. And so this series really is an invitation, just as we had to get everybody and everybody to search for our child because we valued him so much. It's an invitation for all of our campuses in Arcade and Olean here in Wellsville to get on the search committee, to join the search party. And when what is lost is found, when new life in Christ is, is discovered, we celebrate. Because Sunday morning should be a celebration of what God is doing in our lives, in our church as well. So during this series, you can turn to uh, Luke chapter 15. That's where we're going to camp out during the next five weeks or so. Uh, there's this famous passage of Scripture. I'm sorry, I got... I, I, I kind of call this my Indiana Jones Bible. Like, you know, when staff isn't, they're not paying attention, I like whip them with it. Uh, anyways, this is a little annoying. I usually take it off during my sermon, but I forgot today. Um, anyways, Luke, Luke chapter 15 is this amazing passage of scripture that you might be familiar with if you've read through the New Testament. If not, this is going to be a great series for you to get to know this passage of scripture. And it's one of those passages of scripture in the, in the New Testament that has the potential to radically change your worldview, to radically change your perspective of what you should be as a follower of Christ and what the church should be as well as we corporately follow Christ. And I know that because 2,000 years ago, Jesus radically changed the religious system of his day. He radically changed and challenged the, the religious leaders of that day to understand who would be accepted into God's kingdom, who could actually draw close to God. And the reason why I know that is because he got them killed. I mean, this was a tremendous turning point. In fact, if you've ever read through the, the New Testament, you, you read all kinds of stories of Jesus feeding the 5,000, which is 5,000 
men plus women and children. So there must have been like 20,000 people there. There's another time where he feeds 4,000 plus women and children. He's healing the lame, the sick, the blind. He's healing all these other people, feeding a whole bunch of people. He's welcoming little children to himself, upholding the values of women. It's great. And I wonder, like early on in my walk with God, it's like, why would anybody want to kill this guy? I mean, if anybody you want to keep around, it's the guy that can feed 20,000 people, right, when you're hungry. That's the guy you want to keep around, not kill. But this is one of the passages that you come to in the New Testament where you go, oh, that's why they wanted him dead. And so this is what, the early, one of the most important questions of the New Testament is simply this, who is welcome into God's family? And the religious leaders had their answer, and Jesus had his. And as followers of Jesus, we need to be on Jesus' side. So let's look at this. A few verses from Luke chapter 15 to kind of set up this whole series. Um, It's on page 874 in your pew Bible as well if you wanted to follow along there. Otherwise, you can just read it here. It starts off by saying, Jesus says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. Just pause right there. There's two, two groups of people here, the tax collectors and sinners. They're doing what? They're... They're, they're, attracted. They, they, they're attracted to Jesus. They wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. And, and you might look at this and say, you know, they're, they're looking at that and saying, those, those are the bad guys. The, the religious leaders look at that, those people and they, they're, they're the bad guys. You might say, well, what's the big deal about tax collectors? You know, I know no one likes taxes. No one likes giving, you know, taxes. They're hard-earned money to the taxes. But, but don't shoot the messenger, right? I mean, someone's got to collect the taxes. That's how we have schools. That's how we have hospitals. That's how we have things in our society that help us. And so someone's got to collect the taxes, right? So what's the big deal? It's not saying, you got to keep in mind the cultural context, it's not saying the taxes were due and the tax collector charged $30 where it should have been only been 20 and they pocketed the remainder 10. It wasn't like that. If that was the case, easy peasy, we'll forgive them and it's not a big deal. But the tax collectors in that day, if you know anything about Jesus's, the background in here, they were horrible, horrible people. Despicable people. They would take advantage of their own people, their own Israelite people, and they would tax them, overtax them to do this, to fund the Roman army who was oppressing them. They were funding the very army that was oppressing them and doing all these injustices like raping women, treating kids horribly, killing people, treating people like slaves. All these injustices, because these tax collectors were literally taking advantage of the people and overcharging them, they were actually funding the very Roman army that was oppressing them. And how do you actually fund an army that stretched all the way from like India that we know of today to England? That's a huge landmass. How do you do that? A large army. And how do you pay for a large army? You tax people. You just keep taxing people. And so later on, we'll read in, in verse 3 that he was, um, or verse 2, he's eating and receiving these tax collectors. You didn't want to eat with those people. If anything, you wanted to hit them. I mean, they were, it would be, the modern day equivalent would be if ISIS was taxing us and our own people were collecting the money to give it to them so that they could kill us. Why would you do that? It's horrible. I don't want to spend time, I don't want to eat with them. You know, one of the things that this passage is going to do is to challenge who you think could enter into God's kingdom. You know, because we like to be graceful and, you know, we're not that great people and we were saved, but, man, there's a line. And it's almost like we should have, like, a beeping system when the people walk through the door. If, like, you're, you're overly bad, maybe we've got some questions for you. Maybe you shouldn't be in the sanctuary. Because we all have to come to the conclusion of we have to answer the question, too, who is welcome into God's family? Tax collectors are horrible people. And then, and then sinners... And you might read it and say, well, what's the big deal? Everybody's a sinner. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. What's the big deal? This is a, when they used the word sinners in the New Testament, it was a whole different class of people that referred to um, people that were deformed. Think about this. Remember the passage of Scripture in the New Testament where, where the, the guy who was blind from birth, they said, who sinned? Was it that guy or was it his parents that he was born blind? Neither. Like, what does that have to do with anything? they all automatically assumed that because you were blind or because you were deformed, because you had a disease like leprosy, that you were a sinner, that you just did some horrible, horrible things. And yeah, we're all sinners, but they were, they were a different class. I think about the prostitute. That, that was in that category as well, prostitutes. I think about the woman at the well in John chapter 4, if you know that story. She had um, five husbands, and the, the person she was with at that point wasn't even her husband. And so the Bible gives us a very unique detail about the time in which she went to draw water. She goes out and draws water at noon. 
You don't draw water at noon when it's really, really hot. When do you go draw water? In the morning when it's cold, when it's cool. She didn't want to do that because she was afraid that she was going to be stoned. She was going to be outcast, and she goes to the well when no one else was there. Because these Pharisees, these religious leaders that we're about to read about, they stiff-armed all these people away from God because of who they were, that they couldn't even get close to where they were. It's crazy. These were the bad people. And then it says this in in verse 2. It says, and the Pharisees and the scribes, this is the other set of people, these are the good guys, so to speak. They grumbled. They started complaining. This man receives sinners and eats with them. Um, these were the, quote, unquote, the good guys. I think um, if you think you're holy, I don't know if you think you're holy, if you think you got it together, you've been going to church for a while, maybe you read your Bible, you get up early and 5.30 in the morning, you start reading God's word. These people would be like, I haven't slept in a week. You know, I've been reading my Bible all week. You think you've got a few verses memorized? I told you this before, but they, they had the first five books of the Bible memorized, which is known as the Torah. Memorize. You think, you know, it's like take your few verses and stuff it. I got the whole Bible memorized, you know? They were so beyond our religious system, it was ridiculous. The law said you got to honor and keep the Sabbath. They said, all right, I'll, I'll keep the Sabbath. I won't work on the Sabbath. In fact, I'll do you one better. They added on top of man's or God's law, and they said, I'll mark out how many steps you can actually take on the Sabbath. That's how legalistic I'll get about it. And so these, these people, these pastors, essentially, these Pharisees and scribes of religious systems leaders, they said, I don't particularly like the people that were gathering around Jesus. Jesus, what would people say if they saw you hanging around with this prostitute? What would people say if they saw you hanging around these people who are stealing money from us? What would people think? And and Jesus, read between the lines, Jesus is essentially saying when he says, I receive you and I eat with you, which is really important in their culture, he's saying, these are my people. This is who I came to die for. This is who I'm going to give my life for. These are my people. Why would you try to keep them away from me? And in doing so, Jesus totally demolishes their whole worldview, their whole religious perspective, which shows you why they wanted to kill him, wanted to get rid of him and end his life. Makes me wonder, though, how would you respond? How how do you respond? When certain groups of people, sometimes we make it harder for them to come to know God. And then it says in verse 3, this is Jesus' response. I'll give you the, I'm giving you the context, but he says this in verse 3. So he told him this parable. Now Luke 15, if you know Luke 15, um, many people know just like the story of the, the older son, the younger son, the story of the prodigal son. You've heard the, the phrase, the, the story of the prodigal son. People just focus on that, but it's actually Luke 15 is a whole chapter of one parable with three parts. So it's three stories, but one parable. And all of these stories are interlinked. They all have the same purpose. And the purpose is, it's Jesus's response to these religious leaders, these Pharisees and scribes who didn't like the group of people that Jesus was hanging around with. They didn't like the group of people that he was forming as his quote unquote church, his community. And so Jesus responds by giving them three stories. And the first one is the story of, if you know this story, it's the story of a shepherd who had 100 sheep in his herd. And um, he's got 100 sheep. There's a story of a woman who had 10 coins. She loses one of the coins since she had nine. And then there's the story that you probably know, the, pro- the story of the prodigal son, um, the story of the father who had two sons. What's interesting about these stories is that there was a search, and then in each story there was a party. Notice the double entendre of the title of this series. There's a double meaning there. Um, I'll go one by one so you get an overview of the, what happened here. Um, the shepherd, he had 100 sheep, and then one goes missing, which let's give him some credit. If I had 100 sheep, I wouldn't have a slightest idea when one was missing. You know what I mean? Like, I have no interest in counting sheep. I've got one puppy, and I can barely keep a track of him. Like, if we had 100 puppies, I don't care. Like, For him to notice that one sheep is missing shows you something about his character, shows you something about his love for those sheep. And and financially speaking, it's pretty stupid for him to leave the 99 and go after the one. You think about it. If you had $99, Ethan, if I gave you $99, $99, would you 
Leave the $99 to go after just $1 bill. Leave it in your pew, leave it in your chair, and it's safe, right? No one's going to touch his $99. Would you leave your $99 in the open and go after a dollar bill? And the answer is, nah. I mean, I'm good with 99. 99 is almost 100. Like, if I was counting the sheep, it would be like, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 85, 90. That's good. That's good. I'm, we're good. Because 99 is almost 100, but not in God's kingdom. So what does the shepherd do? He leaves the 99, goes after the one, finds the sheep, puts it on his shoulders, comes back into the herd, and he throws a party for a stupid sheep. Like, the sheep got himself lost. Do you notice that? The sheep wandered. The sheep got himself lost in this whole story, but yet the shepherd still throws a party. The, the, the other story is the, the story of the woman who had 10 coins. She loses one of the coins. I don't know if, you, if you're anything like me, but if I lose a coin, it's like, especially if it's in your house, we'll find it later, you know? I'm sure Jojo will come up with it. We'll find it later, you know? He'll, he'll, he'll eventually get to it. It's, and even though a coin in that culture was a little bit more significant than just a quarter, it was equivalent of a day's wage, the amount of energy that she spent tearing up her house, searching high and low to find this lost coin, she could have just got overtime, like on her job. Like she could have just made it up easily. But what does she do? She tears her whole house apart. She finds this one coin. And then what does she do? She throws a party that keep in mind, probably cost her more than what the stupid coin was worth. She probably spent more on the party than that particular lost coin. It's illogical, this type of love that this woman shows for this coin. And then we get to the story of the, the prodigal son, the, the story of where most people say it's the story of the older son and the younger son. But really, in financial terms, it's the story of the wise son and the dumb son. The dumb son says, I want my money. Dad, I want my money, and I want my inheritance, which shows you that he wanted his father dead. You're as good as dead. You can pass away at any point. Just give me my money. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live how I want to live. And so what does he do? He goes, and the father, notice, gives him exactly what he wants. Dads, you know this. Mothers, you know this too, that if your kid asked you for something unreasonable that was going to hurt them in the future, what do you say? No, right? You go, go to your room. Like, no, not getting it. No. The father in this story doesn't do that. The father in the story gives the son exactly what the son asked for, knowing that at the end of that road, he would discover that there's no place like dad's place. And so he goes and squanders all of his money, lives wildly, ends up in a pig pen, and wants to come back to his father, not as a son, but as a hired worker. But his father would have none of that. The story goes that his father sees him off in the distance, and what does he do? He runs. Doesn't walk casually. And, and at any point in the story, this has got to be, if, especially if you have kids, you know this to be true. This is like one of those I told you so moments. Like, it's not run. He, it's like, I'm running, and I'm going to tell you something, you know what I mean? Like, we're going to talk about this. That's why I'm running. That wasn't, that's not the reason why he ran. The Bible says he ran with compassion. And he puts a ring on his finger, he gives him some new clothes, a robe, and he, he kills the fattened calf. Like, I don't know how many parties you've been to with steak, but I, I've, I, I don't go to many parties with steak. You know why? Because there has to be a life-altering event for there to be steak there, like a wedding, you know? Like, how many parties have you been to with a steak? This is something significant. And, and, and Jesus, keep in mind, all three of these stories, he's reminding us of what the context is. And that is we need to remember that it's his response to a bunch of people who were, a bunch of religious church-going folk that were grumbling over the type of people that were coming to Jesus, who were gathering around him. And he says, I got a story for you. In fact, I got three stories. And they're each gonna show you how I love. And in doing so, the story of the, the shepherd, the woman, and the father reveal how Jesus loves. He says, this is what I do because this is who I am. I am the shepherd. Jesus says, I am that woman. And Jesus says, I am that father. And doesn't it stand to reason, I'm just talking to the people who call themselves followers of Christ, but doesn't it stand to reason that if that's how Jesus loves, 
then that's how we are to love as well. You may say, well, I thought you just said, Jeremy, that, that Jesus is the shepherd and that Jesus is the woman and that Jesus is the father. Why was that, what does it have to do with me? Well, don't you know that as Christians, we're to look like who? Jesus. And so throughout all three of these stories, what's really interesting is that you'll, you'll notice a thread that's woven throughout all of them. And it's kind of like a, a four-part progression that you see in every single one of these stories. And it goes like this. Something's lost. It's really simple. There's a search. There's something that's found, and then there's a party. Something's lost, there's a search, something's found, and then there's a party. It's a constant theme through every single one of these stories that is given by Jesus in response to the question, who gets to hang out with Jesus? Who gets to come to church? Who gets to be a part of God's family? Here's the danger. We can become a church, and if you're just visiting, this isn't really for you. I'm glad you're here. This is people that really call this church their home. The danger is If we become a church that's throwing a party, essentially, for the same people for so long, here's what's going to happen. We we end up running the risk of forgetting why we throw parties in the first place. You can come to church for so long, see the same people for so long, sit in the same seat for so long, talk to the same people in your small group or at church for so long, and you don't even see any new people, no new life, no new life in Christ, no salvation, no, no, no baptism or anything like that, that, that here's what's going to happen. And this has happened to so many churches that have died. They forget the reason why they're there in the first place. They forget the whole reason, the whole context of why the, the fat cow was killed and that there was steak and potatoes, hopefully, was because something was lost and now is found. It's a reason to celebrate. Sure, we come to worship, to worship and glorify God, and we sing, and there's, that's huge. But we also should come anticipating that God's going to change someone's life and that we're partners with him in bringing people into a place of grace where they can experience that. And when we lose that, it's kind of like, why are we here again? Like, what, what, What's the party again about? So, oh, yeah, something was lost and now is... Found. We have to remember that. We have to remember that. So the question we need to ask as a church is simply this. Are we going to be a church that sees lostness for what it is? Uh, are we going to be a church that joins God on, on the search party? Are we going to join in on the search? Are we going to be a, a church where if you're a believer, you understand the implications of you being found? When you're found, you've, there's some responsibilities with that. And are we going to be a church that continually celebrates new life in Christ. And let me tell you why these questions are so important. Because as a community of of people who are gathering around Jesus, just like in Luke chapter 15, the beginning of the passage, as a community of people who are gathering around Jesus, here's the goal, and here's what's at stake. If we don't do these things, we don't look like the founder of the church. And are we really even a church? If we're not sharing the heart of the Father and what he's concerned about, something's lost, I got to join him on the search, I understand the implications of my foundness, and I'm going to celebrate new life in Christ, and I'm going to celebrate what God's doing in all of us as we approach Jesus and grow closer to him. I don't know if we're even doing church because it certainly doesn't look like the community that was gathering around Jesus. And so I wrote some phrases down that um, I hope that our church continues to be. I think we're doing some of this very well, but I think we need to become. Uh, Here's the first one I wrote down. You can write this down on your notes if you want. Um, also, I, w- I was reminded if you have the app, all, this, all these notes that you see on the screen are on your app. So just, there you go. Um, here's what I wrote down. I see a church where what is lost is noticed. Um, notice that the shepherd notices one sheep's missing. The woman, even though she's got nine coins, she notices the, the one coin is missing. Of course, the dad notices. He'd be a horrible dad if he no- didn't notice that his kid was gone. But he noticed that something was missing. Are we going to be a church? And what I mean by church, are you, you, right here, in this section, over here, in this section, and only in arcade, are you guys going to be the church individually that notices people out in the community when you rub shoulders with them in your workplace and at your home or your friends or family, whatever it is, however you interact with them? Are you going to notice that they're broken? Are you going to notice that they're hopeless without Christ? Are you going to notice when they don't have freedom in Christ? Are you going to notice those things, or are you just going to constantly go about conversations that they're casual? Like, yeah, you're good, you know? Well, maybe we'll talk about that later, but there's no urgency behind what you do. 
Are we going to be a church where more and more people come and, you know, Every campus is growing. It's, it's, it's great. It's wonderful. It's exciting news. But are we just going to be a bigger church as we get growing larger and larger with not many people? Or are we going to be a small church that has a lot of people? And what, what I mean by that is we notice the brokenness. We notice people's brokenness. We notice each other's brokenness, and we care about the one. Does one matter? Does one really matter to us? You know, the truth of the matter is when you look at your spiritual journey, if, for those of you who call, the, call yourself Christians, when you look at your spiritual journey, at some point along the spectrum, you re- realize that you were broken. You realize that you were lost, and you realize that you were hopeless without Jesus. And at some point, someone introduced you to the hope of the gospel. Someone introduced you to God's grace, and your life was transformed, and you, you, were, you experienced joy. You experienced forgiveness. It was awesome. And then at that point, everything changed. He cared so much about your pain that he is willing to step in your pain. Isn't that true with other people that don't yet know Christ? One of my favorite verses in the the New Testament is what Paul writes to the Corinthian church in in 2 Corinthians 5.21 where he says, he says of Jesus, for he who knew no sin, meaning he was perfect, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. That, That literally on the cross, I don't know if you know this, but on the cross as Jesus hung there, he took the sin of the world that's why the sky, the sky went dark. We, we, we sing that song, um, How Deep the Father's Love, uh, and it goes like this. How, how deep the Father's love, how vast beyond all measure. I, I really stepped into that. I don't know the words. Uh, I don't know. Google it, Tim. Let me know. Um, it goes so well with this. So anyways, are we going to be a church that recognizes people's pain and, 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 and embrace that pain and actually go to it just like Christ did for us, that in your pain, Christ leaned in and lended a hand to you to save you. He saved you. Are we going to be the, the church that lends a hand to other people and, and embraces the one that matters? Here's, here's another thing I wrote down. Uh, I see a church where everyone participates in the church uh, or in the search. Everybody participates, not just a few people, not just a small percentage of people, not just the pastors. But you notice in this story, if we're going to become like Jesus, and Jesus is the shepherd, the woman, and the father in this story, and if we're to be like those people, we have to participate in the search. Notice that the, the shepherd, the woman, and the father all participated in the search. Here's a question for you individually, not like corporately, but individually. Are you actually participating in the search? Are you participating in inviting and engaging with people in gospel-centered conversations? Are you sharing your testimony with people at your work when something comes up in a conversation where there's turmoil or maybe there's a transition in their life or maybe there's trouble? I look for those three T's a lot of time, transition, turmoil, trouble. Um, Are you going to be the person that enters into that conversation and shares the hope that you have in Christ? Are you participating in the search? Or are you just kind of on the sidelines? You know, are you are you the guy in like aisle 12 of Kmart when I'm frantically looking for my three-year-old and you're just like, yeah, this is a good sale. Like, I don't care. You know, like, why? You know how ridiculous that is? Something's lost. My child's lost. The father's child's lost. And, 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 and too often we just kind of, eh, who cares? That, I think that breaks the heart of God that we take such a casual approach to something that matters deeply to our Father. Jesus doesn't want us to be a church, I think, where we're more concerned about the lost TV remote than we are lost people, right? I think, I mean, just to be honest, I think some of us get more excited about finding the lost TV remote under our couch than we are about people who don't know Jesus. It's like, I get it. You know, I get it. I get four kids that constantly lose the TV remote. But if that is the case, we got a problem as a church. I don't think church was ever intended to be a place where you sit and listen, which I'm glad that you listen to me. You know, I'm glad that you're listening, and I'm glad that you're engaging. And I don't think church is just to be a place where we sing, although I'm glad. I'm, I'm, sure, you, I'm sure you appreciate people singing, Tim and Andy. That's, that's good. But I don't think church should just be a place where we come, sit, learn, listen. It also needs to be a place where we go and seek and extend God's love to those who need it. I wrote this down. I hope, I, hope you don't, I, don't, I hope you don't forget it. May we never be a church that replaces mission and compassion with Sunday morning services. This is cool, 
I'm glad you guys showed up at 10.45 in the morning on Sunday morning. And I'm glad that Tim, you know, led worship with the team, Andy and, and, and Nathan, although Nathan's not there today. Congratulations, you guys had a baby. And uh, Jeremy Wilton in Arcade, they, they, they do a good job leading worship, right? But there's got to be something more to it. If, if we replace just Sunday morning singing, the stagnant type of Sunday morning service with real mission and real compassion for people who are broken in our communities here in Wellsville and beyond and Arcade and beyond and only and beyond, we're kind of missing it, don't you think? I'm not sure if we're sharing the heart of the Father when we're doing that. The degree in which you search for something, I'll say it again, and the length in which you're willing to go to find that lost thing and the energy that you're willing to expend to find that lost thing that is so valuable actually communicates how valuable you think it is. So let me ask you a question. How valuable are lost people to you? How valuable are broken people to you? How valuable are people that in, your, in your family that don't know Jesus to you? How valuable are your friends that don't know Jesus to you? And what length are you willing to go to? Because the length that you're willing to go to actually tells me how serious you are and how valuable you think they are. You know, it's not like, oh, we gave Josiah 15 minutes, you know, he's lost. I got three other sons, you know, like, see ya. No. There's too much at stake. You'll, you'll, you'll know how much I love Josiah when I keep looking and keep searching and keep pursuing. You'll know it. I'll show it. Don't tell me that lost people are valuable to you and, and brokenness is something that's near and dear to your heart because Jesus says it is and lost people matter to God, therefore it should matter to me. Don't tell me you do that if you're not showing it. It needs to be shown. We need to show it. I see a church, I wrote this down, number three, where our foundness is still fresh. You know, we have a saying at our church, it's over there on our DNA banner, one of our core values as a church, if you're new to our church, we say it all the time, it's, it's found people, find people. That if you've been found by the grace and love of Jesus, you'll go about finding other people, right? When you've experienced something that changes your life, what do you naturally want to do? What do you naturally want to do? You want to go share it with other people. When you, I've said this before. When you go to a great restaurant, when you've had this great dessert, you'll naturally share it with other people because it's something good. How much greater news do we have that Jesus saved us from the pit of hell and has set our feet upon a rock and we get to go to heaven based off of what he did, not based off of what we did? That's good news. And so we, we're found and we go about finding. Here's where I think people don't do that. They've forgotten somewhere along the way that they are found. I think we have forgotten the fact that years ago, we've forgotten the, how it felt to be without Jesus. We've forgotten the hopelessness that we had without Jesus. We've forgotten how messed up we were. And some of us are still a little messed up. That's all right. We've forgotten what it was like before that, we've forgotten our foundness. Our foundness is never fresh. I don't mean this to insult some of the older saints of the church, but if your testimony starts off with 40 years ago, blah, 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 and it's always 40 years ago and 40 years ago, and it's never present, and it's never fresh, you've forgotten. You've forgotten something about your foundness. Have we forgotten the joy of our salvation, and does the joy of our salvation and what Jesus has done for us make any difference and impact of how we approach people in our community that don't know Jesus. It should. And if it hasn't, our foundness is not that fresh. I, th I thought about, I'll share this story. I thought about, um, I don't know, about six months ago, maybe a year ago, at our Wellsville campus here for the other campuses, uh, someone was greeting at the door. We had a volunteer that was greeting at the door. and um, he, was, he was either smoking or a cigar or a cigarette, which I'm not advocating smoking. So don't send me an email. Um, but, but he was there doing his job, doing a great job, welcoming people, greeting people, and smoking his cigarette, okay? He started coming to church, that's fine, and uh, smoking his cigar. So there was someone visiting that particular Sunday that used to go to our church like a long time ago. I wasn't even here. Maybe when he was younger, he used to go to the church, but he recognized me as the pastor. And I don't think I was preaching that day, so I was out in the foyer a lot longer just welcoming people, greeting people after the service had started, and he comes up to me, he says, Pastor, you know, to essentially says, you know, why? Why? Why would you let that? You know, you got to do something about it. Would you talk to them about that? And I kindly and, you know, politely responded. I said, 
where else would you rather have them smoke? Why is the, why is the requirement for you to come to church to stop smoking before you come to church? And it goes deeper than that, you know what I mean? Why is it you have to have your life all together before someone could come into this place where we call a place of grace? So I, 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 I responded to him, but in my response I was saying, we're not that church. You know the church we are? We're a place of grace. We're a place where it's okay not to be okay. And that's okay with me. Not that I'm saying it's okay to like stay not okay. We'll give you some time. This isn't cheap grace. This is transformative grace. But we're going to be a place, make, make no mistake, we're going to be a place that extends God's love to people who are far away from him at the point they step through the door so that they can find new life in Christ. You want to be a part of that church? I do. I want my family to be a part of that church. I want all of our campuses to be a part of that church. The question is, what's it worth to extend that grace to others? May we not be a church that's so quick, our culture is so quick, Social media is added to this, but it's, we're so quick to give our opinion. We're so quick to give our perspective. We're so quick to tell us what we do. When you're dealing with lost people who don't share the same worldview as you, you don't start with your opinions. You start with love, and you start with grace, and you start with sympathy, and you love on them until they're at a point where they can hear the gospel and be transformed. That's the church I want to be a part of. I see a church where our foundness is still fresh. And I, I wrote this down, and this is my last one, and then we'll close. I see a church where there's an expectation of a celebration. I love coming to church, and the reason why I love coming to church every Sunday is it's partly because of you, because of the stories that you share, the prayer requests that you guys share. I, I always get the connection cards on Monday morning. I start looking through them. Who, who accepted Christ as their Savior? Who's interested in baptism? Who wants to get plugged into a small group? And I, I really appreciate the people that have shared prayer requests that they're so open. Some people don't even put confidential. They're so open to their church family that says, pray for me. I'm really struggling in this area of my life. Would you help me? I love that. I love the anticipation that every Sunday we could have someone come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. The next Sunday we could baptize them. The next Sunday they could get plugged in. There's anticipation, you know? If all we're ever doing is just holding Sunday morning services and going through the motions without any expectation and anticipation of new life in Christ, God help us. We'll be dead. We'll be dead like every other church that has taken that approach to ministry. But if we keep those four things in mind that is woven throughout each of these stories, that lost people matter to God, that he's invited you to be a part of the search, and that we need to find people who need to know Jesus, and then we celebrate when it happens, we'll be all right. And not only will we be, we'll be all right, but I really think, and we've seen this, we'll go to places that we never thought possible and we'll reach people that we never thought possible and we'll actually do things that we never thought possible either. And just ask Becky and trying to think who else went on the mission trip from here. You didn't go, Owen, so be quiet. Uh, Janet, still be quiet. So I, I think if you were to ask them a year ago, do you think based off of the direct directory of your life and how you were headed, you would be in the Dominican Republic. That would have been hard to believe. But, but when we choose to love like Jesus, to choose to love like the shepherd, to choose to love like the woman, and choose to love like the father in the story, I'm telling you, you'll go places where you never thought possible. And with that said, I got some really, really exciting news to share with our church. All that to say, I got some really exciting news to share with you about the, the future direction of our church that I really, really want to share with you. Next week. Next week. I know. How's that for a teaser? You got to wait a whole week, but I promise you we're going to share something with the church next week that's really, really cool. God has opened up an opportunity, and we're excited to be able to share that with you. So with that said, I want to invite the worship team to come forward at all of our locations. Sorry. And uh, I do have five questions for you to consider. So ignore the, the noise that they bring to the stage, how disruptive they are. Just ignore them. And focus on these five questions. 
put them up on the screen there, guys. I want you to consider these questions because we're going to be like, we're going to be saturated in this this um, this chapter in Luke chapter 15 over the next five or six weeks, and so continue to chew on them. I guess is what I'm asking you to do. But here's the first question: Lost people do matter to God, but the question is, do they really matter to you? And if they don't really, really matter to you, then then maybe you need to ask God to take that callus off of your your heart so that you can feel some of the brokenness and the pain that those people actually experience without Christ. Here's the second one. What is it worth to you to see a lost person found? Is it worth an awkward conversation? Is it worth going out of your way? Is it worth a little bit of your time, a little bit of your talents even that you bring, that you're skilled at, that you can bring to the local church? Is it even worth your money to be able to invest into an internal um, ministry that reaches people for Christ? Is it actually worth it? It's a good question. Here's another one. Who can you invite to the party? I, I think Sunday morning is kind of like a party where it's a celebration. I'm asking you to consider each and every one of you here in Wellsville, Arcade, and Olean, who can you bring to the party? Who can you bring for the anticipation of a celebration that perhaps God wants to do in their life? Here's, here's number four. If you don't know of anybody, because again, I'm not asking you to go to another church and steal all their sheep. We got our own hundred sheep that we got to keep. I'm talking about lost sheep, okay? If you don't know very many lost people, what can you personally do to position yourself in a a, a location, a, a, a situation in your life where you're around other lost people, uh, getting involved in sports, getting involved in the school, getting involved in community outreach. Here's just come on up. Just come on up. This is Owen. Um, what can you do to, to change that? And here's the fifth one I want you to leave with. Um, is church only a place you go to on Sunday morning? Is it just an event that you go to that you sing kind of this mass karaoke, you know, that they're about to sing? Is it just that, or is it this? Is it a family you belong to and a mission that you're a part of? I hope, I don't want to do this right now because I might get depressed, but I hope that if we surveyed all of our campuses, every single person that attends our, our campuses, if we surveyed um, people, if you thought of this as a family that you're committed to, that if, at the first sign of trouble, and the first sign of disturbance, and the first sign of, I don't like that, you leave, you know? If we surveyed, are you a part of the mission? Are you participating in the search? I, I, I really hope by the end of the series, um, if it might be lower now, we'll increase that so that more and more people really feel a part of God's family here, and more and more people will feel part of his mission. I want to pray for us. Lord, thank you so much for um, family, for church. Thank you for the example that you gave in Luke chapter 15, that it's not just three stories, three random stories about lost things, but there was a context that you gave that we need to be reminded of, that all these sinners and tax collectors and evil and horrible and outcasts of society people were gathering around you, Jesus. And your response wasn't to shun them. Your response wasn't to... um, isolate them. Your response wasn't to not accept them. You embraced them. You received them. You ate with them. You loved on them when they least expected it and least deserved it. And I pray that we would be a church that does that. We would be a church full of found people, finding people, a church full of safe people, serving people in love when they least expect it and least deserve it. I pray that we more and more as we are concerned about lostness and that we join the search and we embrace our foundness and celebrate new life in Christ, that we would look more like a church that you would want to lead. And it's in Jesus' name we ask this. And all God's people said, amen.